Well, thank you, Roger. <clears throat> um, the idea for this um, summit actually came in a collaboration and um, and the American Alpine Club. Um, you know, when you retire as a superintendent, um, you know, it was sort of the end of my con um, and make a presentation at the at the summit. And so um, I'm privileged to be here. Um, I grew up here in Colorado, born and raised in Fort Collins. Age of 15, when I joined the Colorado Junior Group, I mean the Fort Collins Junior Group of the Colorado Mountain Club. And those uh, recreational opportunities and friendships that came, I, uh, I was sort of directed into a career in the National Park Service. And over the years, I've worked in about five or six other parks, including Grand Canyon and Yosemite, um, and, um, and ended my career as superintendent of Denali, which as uh, I tell when I was going to go hiking, when I was going to go climbing up to today. Um, during the 10 years or uh, 11 years that I was at Denali, management plans for all the parks in Alaska, and Denali, I kind of got that effort started, and I got to continue the process. It took over six years from beginning to end to develop, and we learned a few things. And by the way, um, we didn't learn by being successful, we learned by making mistakes. And then we had to go back and correct, and probably why it took six years to do. Um, so what I'll cover today is uh, some background on why the plan was needed, um, it's a, a brief description of the public process that we used to develop the plan, which was key to our success. Um, a description of the management strategies that uh, are contained within the plan uh, for implementation and a toolkit of actions that the Park Service um, can use to uh, implement or to manage the backcountry and deal with issues that arrive, arise. And, and uh, we'll end with five lessons we learned uh, from the experience that might be useful to you. Denali spans the Alaska Range, about 250 miles north of Anchorage and about 150 miles south of Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, the, this is Denali right here. The park's about uh, 6 million acres or 2.4 million hectares. It was established in 1917 um, to protect the doll sheep that roamed the park or the Alaska Range from market hunters who were at the time um, shooting wild animals to feed the miners and the railroad construction crews that were building the Alaska Railroad uh, across the state. Um, Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America, um, was also included in the park, not necessarily as an afterthought, but certainly not the primary reason for having created the park. Um, the first backcountry management plan in Denali was written in about 1976, and at the time, the park was only two million acres, Mount McKinley National Park. Um, probably the, one of the most major events in park history occurred in 1980 when the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act was passed by Congress. Uh, 54 million acres or park lands on one day in one, it's been billed as the greatest conservation legislation in the history of the world. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but that's what I've been told. Um, well, the two million acre park was in line, and um, in addition to that, the old Mount McKinley National Park, the two million acres, um, was designated, federally designated wilderness. And so the management policies for that park changed in 1980 um, to be managed as wilderness in perpetuity. Um, as you might imagine, um, an action as large as that in a remote uh, state with a small population had a big impact. And the public in Alaska was not supportive of the national parks, nor the creation of the national parks. Um, we had uh, Park Service airplanes burned on the airstrip by local people. Um, we were refused service in hotels, restaurants, and bars. Um, we were afraid for our safety uh, in many of the communities for a period of time. Um, it was a difficult time for, for the Park Service. Um, and that continued for, for a number of years afterwards. Um, but, um, 
by 1988 or 1998, when the plan when the plan process started, and no planning had occurred after the general management plans in 1980 to 83, um, when it started, um, we really tried to focus down on where the most need was and where the biggest benefit would come from. And the 1976 backcountry plan for Denali was a good place to start, but it didn't cover the whole park. It only covered that two million acres of wilderness, and, and beyond that, it was out of date. Visitation to the park had grown dramatically. Um, it wasn't working very well. The scope and extent of the existing activities, uh, backpacking, climbing, uh, skiing, were expected to increase, and we were getting numerous requests for additional kinds of activities in the park, um, including dog sled trips, um, um, aircraft overflights, glacier landings, and things that we hadn't had to deal with in the past. Um, and we expected that we were going to get more and more of those over the next 20 years. Um, the changes in backcountry use patterns required that the Park Service take some action to protect park resources and, and the wilderness character. So those were kind of the motivators to go through this process. Uh, two decades of acrimony among Alaskans over the enlargement of the park system and of the park um, created an, an atmosphere, if you will, uh, of, uh, of um, anti-park service. Pro-access, we want access to our state lands. The National Park Service, the federal government has, quote, locked up our land and we can't use it anymore. Um, and um, so we had to get through that or get past that and it took a long time to do um, and we're still working on it today but I think things have changed um, somewhat over the past few years. And I think the process that we went through at Denali helped um, between, helped start that process for a lot of other places in the state. Um, the, the public at the time in 98, what, I mean, they weren't willing to come sit down. If they, if they went to a public meeting, and we had a few, if they went to a public meeting, it was to have a demonstration against the park. It was go home. And trying to have a public meeting that provided really useful, realistic feedback was difficult. Nonetheless, we started the Denali Backcountry Management Plan and, um, and, and worked forward from there. Um, it, in <clears throat> we conducted several uh, public meetings in 1998 and 99. We conducted numerous open houses with the people uh, in the communities around the park and in the major cities in, in Alaska proceeding very slowly because we were still getting a lot of opposition and a lot of acrimony in these meetings um, and trying to outline what a new backcountry management plan might look like for Denali. Now mind you, uh, as Arrestus asked about the general management plan and the relationship of these plans to each other, Denali already had a general management plan. It's a broad document, broad policy statements about how we're going to manage the park. Um, and generally, the, uh, a climbing management plan or a backcountry management plan or wilderness stewardship plan would be a step down under the general management plan, be more specific, more precise, more prescriptive, perhaps, uh, than the general management plan itself. Um, but as things developed, and our intent was to develop that prescriptive, elevating the backcountry planning process to major issues that needed to be addressed in this backcountry management plan, subsistence was one of the most important ones. Um, the law that created Mount McKinley that resulted in Denali National Park at six million acres also legally required us to allow trap, fish, and gather, and so we had to adjust to that, that opportunity for the local people and to manage it effectively. And of course, they wanted to be able to go where they wanted, when they wanted, how they wanted, to hunt moose, caribou, um, uh, wolves, and other wildlife. Um, and of course, as you might imagine, there were other groups, the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, the National Park Conservation Association, who didn't see it that way. And they wanted us to restrict that access and use to the smallest. It was an issue yeah. for subsistence purposes. One of the local communities wanted access to the ATVs, um, and so that use of ATVs was a big issue that we had to deal with. Snow machine use. Um, the previous incredibly difficult um, personal and professional battle, if you will, no machine users wanted to open that issue up again. The Park Service, less than six years since the Park Service would be concerned about um, sounds in the, in the environment. 
But now Denali comes mostly from aircraft flying allowed to land and take off. To deliver them. And it was really interesting that the aviation plan progress and um, as well. Um, on Maui significantly, and there was crowding on sections, uh, on technical sections of some of the most popular routes, especially the, the West Buttress route, which had the potential for jeopardizing visitor safety um, in bad weather, et cetera. Um, human waste management at the major camps along the West Buttress route and was a, a major issue. And, um, and in fact, um, because of the perceived cloud crowding on and more climbing was starting to occur in peripheral, peripheral areas like Little Switzerland and the Eldridge Glacier, there were um, on uh, and regulations to prevent uh, and um, and also that extended to some of the other popular major uh, point of discord, if you will, in in creating the plan. And um, and last but not, uh, guided hiking was growing rapidly using the park um, to guide hikes. The aircraft overflights were increasing rapidly um, for air tours, flight seeing, and glacier landings. Airplanes, um, airplanes making landings on the glaciers in Alaska range was primarily up until then a, a means of transporting mountaineers to the mountain or to other locations in the backcountry for climbing. But uh, in, the, in the late 80s, in 90s, um, with the growth in tourism, et cetera, um, that started to change. And now um, there's more than 3,000 landings a year on the park's glaciers, the majority of which, more than two thirds of those landings, were brief stops with scenic tour passengers in their street shoes to get off the airplane and make a snowball and feel a glacier and be able to say, I landed on a glacier in, Mount, in Denali National Park. Um, and imagine the noise that's associated with that whole experience. Another interesting observation in it to, for this group is that um, beyond the biggest source of complaints for aircraft noise were the climbers on Mount McKinley. And here's what it boiled down to. When we go climbing, we don't want to have to listen to airplanes flying over us. It ruins the, the experience. But of course, it's fine to fly into base camp and back out again. So, you know, one plane a day, I don't know how this works, but nonetheless, um, it, sometimes when things were really getting tight and you were really um, stressed out, thinking about that and, and, and that issue and how you deal with it um, would... Okay, so in, um, we developed an initial draft that addressed each of the issues, and as we had planned, it set use limits and behavioral requirements, just like most backcountry management plans do for all of these different um, issues and users to make sure we protected park resources and provide a high quality experience. Um, we released that plan in the spring of 2003, and we received over 9,370 public comments on the draft plan. The most significant comment we received was from the Alaska State Legislature. I'd never in my career received a letter from a state legislature before, but we did. This letter was a comment letter to Secretary Norton, not to the park, to Secretary Norton, and it was published in the Anchorage Daily News, which is the statewide newspaper, as an op-ed piece three days before Secretary Norton was scheduled to come to Denali for a week-long visit and it blasted the Park Service and the plan. Um, they they um, <clears throat> opposed the prescriptive approach, rules and regulations. They, um, they didn't like the fact that there were limited opportunities for the public to participate in the planning process, um, which I took issue with, um, and uh, requested that the plan be um, abolished, that, that it would be uh, redone. Um, so, when the secretary got to Denali, guess what the first order of business was? A meeting with the superintendent and the, and the president of the Alaska State Legislature to explain why we shouldn't discard the plan and start over. It was a very heated meeting, um, and at the end of the meeting, we were ordered to throw the draft away and start over. And so, after um, five years, 
four or five years of effort of planning, we had to, you know, begin again. Um, the, new, the new plan with direction from the secretary uh, would be a revised draft that was much less prescriptive than the original uh, plan and that we would redo the public involvement process to make sure that everybody got a, a, an opportunity to comment on the plan, whether they opposed it or whether they supported it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, then, so in 2003, we began this intense two-year planning process um, that uh, culminated in a final backcountry management plan um, in 2006. There were over 27 public meetings, 50 separate consultations, and um, 15,000 comments, uh, additional comments on top of the 9,000 we'd already received. The new plan was much less prescriptive than the original, and it followed the new VERP, Visitor Experience Resource Protection Model, that was one, and it was one of the first backcountry plans in the Park Service um, in the nation to use this model. That process um, requires the agency to establish desired future conditions, what we want it to look like when it's right. Um, and, and then, um, um, and then manage to those. Um, an example of a desired future condition might be wilderness character is preserved. Or perhaps monitor, um, um, natural systems are protected and natural processes occur unimpeded uh, by human impact. Um, so, so those are the kinds of desired future conditions and there are many others um, that we had to work with. Um, and then we would use monitoring and adaptive management, science and adaptive management to, um, to manage the, the resources and the visitors to meet those desired conditions. Um, the park was divided up into management areas and you, you can see the, the various management areas are different colors here. Um, whoops. This area right here is the old Mount McKinley National Park. That's the two million acres of designated, federally designated wilderness. Um, the rest of the lands are all additions from 1980. Um, Mount McKinley is located right here inside the wilderness. And um, the landing strip for base camp is right on the park boundary here. So we created these different management areas. And, and each of those management areas had a defined purpose. Um, which dictated then the desired future conditions um, of the resource and visitor experience. Um, most of these areas, as you can see, are, are very uh, large, but there were a few that were um, small for specific purposes. Um, so for, God, sorry about that. So for example, um, right down here at the boundary, there's a, a portal area that's only a few dozen acres in size, and that um, is a landing area for glacier landings and air taxis to drop off and pick up passengers. Um, corridors um, occurred in uh, certain areas from Cantwell, for example, in, in this area to allow for additional use of snow machines than was, or was allowed in other areas of, the, uh, of, that, of that management area. Um, so we created uh, corridors for that purpose. And then, in addition, we had the West Buster's Special Use Area, which you see right here, um, which would allow for historic, and, uh, resource, historic visitor experience conditions to continue in the wilderness, uh, even though they weren't consistent with uh, perhaps other standards for the wilderness um, because of historic use and, um, and also to allow for some growth in use over time. Okay, so um, the core of the plan then and how we manage the park is based upon um, standards that are indicators that we were gonna monitor scientifically and, uh, and collect data on. Uh, standards that, we would, that those indicators would have to meet um, and, uh, and, an, and an extensive monitoring and evaluation program. And I'll go through this fairly quickly because it's too small for probably most of you to read. But here's the um, management area descriptions or descriptors for each of the management areas. You'll see them on the, on the left here. And if we pick management area C, it says uh, purpose is to provide uh, opportunities for climbing and mountaineering experiences in the, in the wilderness. Okay, so that's the purpose 
And uh, desired future conditions will be set based upon that. Um, across the top of this matrix are the resource conditions and the social conditions that we need to meet in each of those management areas. Um, so those are, the, in fact, the indicators uh, that we're going to measure. So here um, we have this list, trail and campsite disturbance, evidence of modern human use, landscape modification, litter and human waste, natural sound disturbance, encounters with other people and parties, encounters with large groups, camping density, accessibility, and the administrative presence, the presence of rangers in the backcountry. And if you, um, and then each one of those is, is, falls into a rating, uh, medium, high, low, very high. And uh, you can see then for uh, management area C, the uh, trailing campsite disturbance um, it should be medium, that's our standard. Um, occasional social trails and campsites, um, medium evidence of, of uh, human, modern human use, et cetera. If we go down here to the west buttress, you'll see that there's a different standard here. Trail and campsite disturbance is not applicable, and that's partly because it's on the snow, and maybe wrong, but partly because it's on the snow, and partly because it's that corridor for that uh, we allowed the exception for historic use. Um, and then uh, evidence of human use is high, group encounters is high, a camping density is high. Um, so those standards then are what we're going to manage to. It, we monitor what happens. Um, against those standards, and uh, this, by the way, is a description of each one of the levels of the standards in case you wanted to know, um, you know, what exactly that means. And then along with it is this monitoring and evaluation process. So we man monitor each one of those standards on a regular uh, scheduled basis, collect specific data, and then we use the, uh, we put that data up against the chart that we just showed you to determine whether we're meeting the standard or whether we're failing to meet the standard, okay? And that's how we'll make decisions on what management actions to take or whether a management action is necessary uh, based on this adaptive management process. Okay. Um, so, the indicators that we selected, which was a big part and integral part of the process, um, were selected to represent the resources and conditions that would be allowed to change in the backcountry until they approached a, a quantitative level. And when they approached that quantitative level, if and when they approached that quantitative level, then the National Park Service would take action to prevent them from exceeding um, that uh, desired uh, condition. There was an exception in the plan, and still is, an exception that would allow the Park Service to take action immediately for certain kinds of, uh, of uses or, or circumstances that would be detrimental to the resources uh, of the park. For example, we could um, um, take action to protect uh, or to avoid uh, introduction of exotic species um, or to protect wildlife habitat, particularly during um, uh, critical times like breeding, nesting, or denning to protect subsistence resources and opportunities or to avoid bare human conflicts. So those things didn't require monitoring and evaluation and meeting or not meeting standards uh, in order for the Park Service to take action. Otherwise, um, we'd, all the other things would. So we, we uh, developed a management toolkit or a toolbox, and um, this was how we we're going to achieve those desired conditions. And this was a huge, huge discussion amongst the public to get to this. And the state of Alaska um, was adamant that the Park Service not take any action whatsoever that was stricter than what was minimally necessary to meet the standard. And basically what that says is, here's how bad we're going to allow it to get, right? That's, the standard is the worst case scenario that we're going to manage against. Here's how bad we will allow it to get. And then what, if it gets that bad, we're just going to use the minimum possible tool to reach that, to keep it from going over that line. Not necessarily the best way to manage, in my humble opinion. 
Um, but nonetheless, it was an extremely political process. Um, so we have this management toolkit, and we said, okay, we're going to use this toolkit to manage the resources according to the standards. Um, and they're essentially in order, in, in ascending order of uh, restriction. But we made, it, uh, we made a clear statement that while we'll try to do that, we will take the appropriate action, whether it's the minimum necessary or not. And that is in the plan. So education, printed material, targeted programs to educate the users about how to behave. Uh, things like leave no trace, et cetera. Um, sorry. Let me get, um, increased enforcement of existing regulations. Um, for example, sound, uh, sound equipment, um, noise decibel levels on engines um, for vehicles that are operating in the backcountry, snow machines in particular, or feet, uh, speed limits and things like that that already existed. Um, voluntary restriction requirements, voluntary registration for climbers, voluntary registration for backcountry users, for people going into remote por portions of the park where registration wasn't required, um, but they could um, voluntary, voluntarily register. Voluntarily avoiding wildlife denning areas and um, nesting areas. So those would be the kinds of voluntary restrictions that we might implement. Required registration would be the next step, requiring a permit but not limiting use. And of course, that allows us the opportunity to educate people. Um, technology or other requirements uh, governing means of access. So using quiet technology on airplanes. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about overflights in a minute, but um, it was pretty interesting what happened with this process with the aviation industry who adamantly refused to do anything different and then ended up adopting quiet technology and many other modifications to, once they saw the light, to help minimize impact. Um, Managing commercial activity, as I said, most the commercial activity in the park hadn't been strictly managed uh, up until the plan, and um, and we tried to put the minimum restrictions on commercial activity in the plan um, that we could, but we did allow ourselves the opportunity to adjust contracts um, to require specific actions or to change limits and those kinds of things to protect resources. Um, regulate the numbers of visitors, require permits and limit numbers in the high use areas. And in fact, in the wilderness in Denali, there are use limits for each zone in the backcountry um, of number of overnight users per night. So there are some prescriptive requirements there. It's not very many of them, but there are some. Uh, temporal restrictions, limit access to the times of day and days of the week. Aircraft don't land on glaciers between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., generally speaking. I'm sorry, between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m., so the evenings are quiet. Uh, management authorities of other agencies. Um, we work with the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, who governs the airspace above the park and the state of Alaska um, to um, use their regulations to manage use um, and behaviors uh, in the park, and we can do that even more. So those are the tools that would be used um, to manage the backcountry, and those are the tools that we've used today. And so far, it's been pretty successful. Um, and if, if I were going to do it again, I think I might do it a little bit differently, but I think overall, after those years of trials and tribulations, and, um, that the plan turned out to be a pretty good plan. Um, it has, it's, it's pretty easy to, for the public to see what it is we're trying to accomplish and whether or not we're accomplishing it. It's pretty transparent in that context. And, and interestingly enough, um, after all of those years of public participation, in the end, for the last draft of the plan, we had less than 100 comments. Less than 100 comments. Okay, so we learned a few things, and I'll go through these quickly. Um, first off, include everybody in the planning process and keep them informed on what's happening. It's a difficult thing to do when you're trying to, to hold everything together and figure out the future and deal with the controversy and everything else, but it's really critical that people have the opportunity to know. In the first round, for example, while Mount McKinley was a, a major part of this plan and climbing on Mount McKinley was a major part of the plan and the Park Service proposed to put a strict limit on the number of climbers, the climbing community wasn't engaged. They let it happen. And was that our fault? Perhaps. Was it their fault? Perhaps. The point of it is you need to figure out where the major issues are and figure out who the proponents and opponents are and make sure that, they, that you aggressively go after them to get the best input you can. 
Um, remember, we didn't involve the legislature, and it cost us two years. We definitely involved in the second time around. Establish a dialogue with the, with the disparate interests. Uh, bring them all together. It's a painful experience. Um, some would say more than an enlightening experience. Um, but bring them together and, and moderate the, the dialogue so that, you, you know, that everybody gets a chance to speak and, um, and be a part of that process. Um, the, you know, with the snow machine issue, we um, had a, a number of groups telling us that it was illegal for us to allow for snow machining elsewhere in the park, that we'd closed the old park, we needed to close the rest of the park to snow machines. We have probably 20,000 snow machine users in the park over the course of a year. And, um, and it's one of the prime uh, areas um, in, in the central um, interior Alaska. Um, it, to take that on, number one, to take that on as a, as an, as a topic would be like uh, Yosemite taking on their climbing management plan in the middle of trying to do a revision to the valley plan. Um, it would definitely have dis, you know, diverted attention in that direction and effort and time and money and could have, in fact, uh, submarined the whole planning process. Um, so, so we tried to figure out a way that would, would work that we could avoid a lawsuit, do the right thing for the resource and the right thing for all of the user groups. And what we did by bringing the snow machiners, the Wilderness Society, the Sierra Club, and the NPCA all together um, many times is we worked out a plan to manage snow machining in the park, to limit it to a, a, a reasonable amount, and to manage it through the noise and encounter process um, to make sure that the impact on other users was minimized. And thus, we were able to move forward on that process by establishing that dialogue with those disparate interests. Listen with an open mind. Don't decide what you're going to do and then just listen to those things that support you. Listen with an open mind and, and then decide what to do. Get to know both sides or all sides intimately. The aviation users helped to block that initial plan and uh, it required significant effort over time to bring, those to, uh, bring them to a satisfactory common ground um, in the final plan. Had we listened carefully initially, we might have avoided some of that. Committing, um, committing to a, uh, an adaptive management plan like the Denali Backcountry Management Plan requires uh, monitoring and evaluation of the indicators and that it occurs as planned. And uh, Maura and I were talking yesterday. One of my biggest concerns now uh, as, as staff turns over in the park is that this plan is based, solidly based, on science and monitoring and evaluation. And if funding doesn't allow and if management decisions don't promote adequate gathering, data gathering and analysis, the plan is going to fail. I hope that won't happen. So far it hasn't, but it could. Um, so remember, if you do a, an adaptive management plan, you're committing to a long-term process that's going to be time-consuming and expensive. Um, very, it can be very successful and very useful, um, but it's going to take some effort. Um, we found out quickly how well our monitoring was going when one day we realized that one of our commercial hiking operations was um, using more than their allocated share of the guided hiking on one of the trails. When we started to look into it and monitoring, we found out that they were using 300 times their allocated share, and nobody had caught it. Um, but what happened then was because of that, we went back and we revised, significantly revised our commercial contracts for all of the guiding operations in the park to make sure that, it was, that use was equitably and appropriately distributed and that we had um, adequate information and knowledge of what was going on in those operations. So anyway, monitoring and evaluation is really, uh, is really critical. Um, plan, uh, we, have, we need to make sure that the planners are talking to the implementers. Planners are wonderful people. They're very creative. Um, they're very free-flowing. Um, they're very innovative. And sometimes they're not very realistic. And if you don't have the planners talking to the people that are going to have to implement the plan as you go through the process, you can end up with 
requirements in the plan that can't very easily be implemented. And we had some of those in the in the backcountry management plan. The most, uh, the most, the two most telling, I think, are uh, are, are climbing on Mount McKinley, and uh, aircraft uh, over the noise standards for aircraft uh, over the park. And I think we're we're currently in the process of addressing the climbing issue, the aircraft overflights, um, the noise, the soundscape standards are going to have to be addressed at some point in the next few years. Um, and revised in some way or another to make them realistic because um, we're exceeding those soundscape standards with, with historic use. And, um, and, and, we, and the premise that we built upon was that in general terms, with few exceptions, historic use was acceptable. Um, the national, as a result of the backcountry plan, and, and this is in implementation, we established an air aircraft overflights working group which included commercial aviation, private aviation, the military, um, the environmental groups, um, the local support groups, uh, et cetera. So it was a pretty well-rounded uh, uh, um, committee. Um, and, their, and their task was to um, develop voluntary, voluntary measures to assure safety for passengers, pilots, and mountaineers and for achieving the desired future conditions of the backcountry plan. This was a very difficult process for all of us, um, but we stuck to it. In over six years, um, that group met four time, three, two to four times a year, and when they first started, it was like, you're not doing anything to change my operation, and you're not gonna do anything to make me not do it differently, um, to what can we do together? Um, the, the uh, back in the, in the 80 or in the 90s, um, Congress passed a law requiring air tour management plans for all parks that had air, t air flight seeing, air tour flights over the parks, with few exceptions. Our dear senator in Alaska exempted Alaska from the requirement of an air tour management plan so that we wouldn't have a negative impact on the aviation industry in Alaska. Um, so here comes the overflights group. In 2012, um, um, more than 10 years, or about 10 years since the Air Tour Management Act uh, uh, was passed, there are exactly zero air tour management plans in the national park system. Because the Park Service and the FAA and the users can't come together on what needs to be in there and how they ought to be managed. Interestingly enough, the Denali Overflights Group has made more progress towards air tour management in Denali than all the other parks with the mandate to do air tour management plans. And it's because we've done it by a participatory consensus-based process with all of the disparate interests together in the same room focused on a common goal. And it worked. I mean, I didn't think it would work, but it's worked. Um, they've, they've, um, um, they've moved air tours away, the high altitude air tours, away from the summit of Mount McKinley because the mountaineers were complaining about aircraft buzzing them on the summit. And so they agreed to um, move all of the uh, summit flights away from the summit of the mountain. They're still up there, but they're not flying right over the summit for the most part. It's a voluntary process. Um, they're, they, um, they love to fly up the west buttress. They fly up the Cahilton Glacier and over Cahilton Pass because you get great views of the glacier, great views of the mountain, and you get to see mountain climbers down there at who knows, maybe even 500 feet on a bad day. Um, but mostly they're above 2,000. But they're powering up to go over Cahilton Pass and the sound just reverberates off of the mountains there. And they came together and said, you know, if we go the other direction, we won't be powering out, we'll be coasting down and we'll be a lot quieter. And so now most of the tours have changed direction to reduce the sound impact on climbers on Mount McKinley. Um, and lastly, and most amazing to me, um, is they, they, when we talked about the wilderness and the impact of noise, aircraft noise on the wilderness of Mount McKinley National, or of Denali National Park, um, they said, well, show us where the most important areas to protect are in, in besides the whole thing and let's see what we can do. And they created a no-fly space over the wilderness area of Denali National Park that's actually been working for the last two years. Obviously, there's violations once in a while, but, but generally speaking, the noise standards um, are being um, met in all of that area 
uh, where they were exceeded prior to that, to that group's work on there. So um, I think, you know, overall, the, all sides of the issue of being represented, everybody getting together in the same room and understanding each other's interests and needs um, that has helped them to come to, uh, come to uh, solutions that, um, that make sense to everybody. One last little uh, story. During the planning process, um, when we were asking for public comments, we got a letter from the American Alpine Club. And um, it was a great letter, very insightful. And it commented on a variety of different issues. But what we had proposed in the original plan was to limit commercial use in wilderness to 20, about 25%, plus or minus, uh, of the total use limit if there was a use limit. And the letter from the Alpine Club was very specific. They said, um, while we appreciate your interest in, will it, in, in limiting commercial use in wilderness to about 25%, we don't believe that that's uh, good public practice. And you should, you should absolutely limit the commercial use to no more than 25%, and specifically climbing use, guided climbing use, um, et cetera. So we said, okay. So we wrote it into the plan, you know, no more than 25% of all the climbs on Mount McKinley will be guided climbs. Well, two years later, we discovered that at the time we wrote the plan, almost 30% of the climbs on Mount McKinley were guided. So what do you do? Oh, the other part of it is there's a 1,500 climber limit on Mount, Mount McKinley for the year. We were only, and we still are, only having about 11 or 1,200 people climb the mountain. So there's still two or 300 more spaces for people to climb the mountain, um, and they're not being used. And yet we're limiting commercial use to a, a, set, a small set number. What we're seeing is a change in, demo, uh, in demographics uh, where, where the number of individual climbers on the mountain is going down and the number of guided climbers is going up. And so having monitored that and discovered what was happening, um, we had to go back, again, planners talking to implementers, we've had to go back and rework that whole system to make sure that there's equitability for people and that we're able to provide more guided climbing space for those who want guided climbs uh, up to that limit and climbers um, in, uh, negatively. So thank you, American Alpine Club. They were, once we all discovered what was going on, the Alpine Club's been very helpful in trying to figure out how to get around this problem. So, all those tools in the, in the toolkit that we discovered here. Um, developing the plan was a really long process, uh, but it didn't, it transcended conflict and, and animosity uh, group, or people advocating for Denali and protection of Denali that uh, used to say, you know, give it back, go home, we don't want to bother. Um, <clears throat> so I think in that context it's had great benefit and it'll benefit uh, managers in the future as well. Um, defining for all of the park looks like. Um, identifying the indicators and the standards of whether or not that desired condition has been reached or whether it currently exists. And the toolbox of actions that can be taken to address uh, management issues are the foundation for the future at Denali. Um, with this information and regular monitoring and evaluation, park staff and the various interests can collaborate to achieve and to maintain those desired a common goal. Thank you. Do you have any questions there for Paul? Thanks, Ellen. Um, to some degree, but not as much as probably needed to be um, done and, and will have to be done in the future. Um, you know, we hear lots about what's happening in Glacier now. Well, um, guess what? It's happening even faster in Alaska. And um, glaciers are, are, are receding by hundreds of feet each year up there, um, creating different environmental conditions, different um, sociological conditions, et cetera. Um, we were working on a management plan for the park road and taking climate change much more into consideration uh, over the last few years. And so here's kind of, um, I was talking to the chief of resources and they said, uh, 
people go to see wildlife. We need to, we think, and he said, well, you know, uh, we have today, you're going to have to relocate the park road up onto the entire tundra area that the park road traverses. To. And that's a problem that has to be addressed. Um, and it will affect how the backcountry management plan and the climbing management is done in the park in the future. So we, there's more work to do. Um, if I understand your situation, I understand your question. If I understand your situation, um, the, the new generation, if you will, uh, of climbing um, is not the same as the independent um, rogue climbers of Ch and, and, is, and, and is demanding more experienced, broadly experienced in, in large part. Um, they're more tightly focused and thus um, commercial guiding um, allows them to do things that they couldn't otherwise safely do. And that's a good thing for us, too. Um, but they also want more accommodation. And in Denali, uh, which is des in, in our climbing areas, they're all in designated, wil not all, most of them are in designated wilderness. Um, we're managing the use by limiting the amount of use and educating the public that if you come here guided or not, you have to be prepared because we won't provide those accommodations. We will require you to carry out all your waste. We won't allow you to leave anything on the mountain. We don't have huts. You'll bring your tent or build a snow shelter uh, and use that because there's no other accommodations. Um, that's because it's a designated wilderness and it's managed according to the law. Uh, uh, in other parts and other parks, um, we're we are accommodating that use with public use cabins, uh, huts, and that kind of thing, but not within the wilderness areas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, two questions. The first one, when do you start the monitoring and evaluation uh, after this investigation is being completed? And what are the instruments that you need to, to conduct this monitoring and evaluation? Um, Okay, that was a big one. Do you experience political interference in what you have been planning? For example, you mentioned area A should be a wilderness area. There will be no any development there. But one competition can come and investigate. Why you people are just adhering, adhering to this document, what we call general management plan? We have a very good inventor here from the US. Um, th and that's a good question, too. I, yeah, I'll try and I, I'm not sure I got the first one completely, but in terms of monitoring and evaluation, um, what kind of a schedule and how do you do it? Is that kind of what, how do you do the monitoring evaluation and how often? Right, right. When and how often, or when and, and how? Okay. Um, and then the second one is, how do you deal with these other um, non-conforming uses that don't meet the standards in the plan, um, where there might be benefits to the park or some other way, or might be political pressure to deal with it? Um, so as far as monitoring and evaluation is concerned, we set the monitoring and evaluation uh, process into place as soon as we didn't identified our di indicators. We have in, in Denali a long-term monitoring and evaluation program that monitors climate change. Um, and it's been in place for, since 1988, since 1988. We adapt, or adopted the, that monitoring protocol in the backcountry management plan. So those, the, and basically what happens is we set the park up on a, a grid and we, and we select random points throughout the grid, and we monitor um, each one of those random points every 10 years. Um, so there's you know, 100 points, we monitor 10 points a year. 
until we've monitored the whole thing, and then we start to monitoring over. In addition, then, what we did um, with these, some of the other indicators and standards that are more specific and, and more uh, specific, for example, more specific to backcountry users, like um, presence of man-made structures or um, encounters and that kind of thing. Um, we set up um, uh, through contracts with universities, et cetera, uh, sociological research um, on a five-year uh, basis. So every five years we're doing a number of sociological evaluations of, vis of visitors' perceptions and experiences in the park that we use to help uh, determine what should be done. Um, we've hired a number of new backcountry rangers uh, and changed the job description of some of the staff um, to be more resource monitoring oriented. So instead of being hired as a technician to issue backcountry permits in the office, you're hired as a biological technician with, with that background um, to work both in the office and in the backcountry. And when you're in the backcountry, you're doing the monitoring that needs to be done according to the plan. So we get a lot more bang for our buck that way. Um, and the monitoring occurs, some of it occurs annually, and some of it occurs daily, some of it occurs on a five-year basis, and some of it occurs on a 10-year schedule. Um, we're also set up to be able to adapt that monitoring. If we find out we're not getting good information by one, set, uh, one protocol, we can, with public knowledge, we can change that protocol to something more useful. So far, we haven't had to do that, but I can see it happening down the road. The second question was, how do you deal with these other influences? Um, you know, my experience in the Park Service has been, we, we end up with these big political fiascos over, over complex issues with, you know, hugely emotionally charged issues, and we, and we don't do our homework well. The Park Service doesn't do their homework well. Uh, perhaps, or could do it better, and we end up making a decision that's very unpopular and not supportable by science, not supportable by pu public interest, et cetera, and we get overturned in court, or we get overturned in the, in the public policy arena. Um, I think, it, you know, I worried throughout the entire Denali backcountry planning process that we would end up going to court, and whether or not, if we did, could we defend ourselves, and as somebody, um, from Denver, uh, our, our National Planning Center commented on reading the plan. Um, you know, you know, you may not have all the science that's possible to understand all the resources of the backcountry of Denali National Park, but you have more science and know more about the resources in that than in that park and in that plan than any other plan that's ever been written in the National Park Service. And that was because we had people dedicated to science. We spent millions of dollars doing our protocols, uh, testing them, uh, and gathering data. And we used data from the very beginning, science from the very beginning in putting that plan together. So you can sue me, but you know what? When it comes down to the National Park Service mandate, protect unimpaired for future generations, here's what the science says. And when you say, can we build a lodge, the plan says that you have to maintain the wilderness character, right? That's what it means. And you can go to court on that and you'll win. Um, so we haven't had, I mean, we've tried to work with everybody to the extent that the law and the plan allows us to do, but we haven't had those kinds of um, threats carried out you know, to the ultimate degree. Most people back off before you get to that point just because they see you know, this is really well thought out. These people didn't just do this on a whim. And, and that we all did have an opportunity to participate and for our voices to be heard in the process. Um, can we get overturned in the future? Yep, it's possible. You know, that's what the court's uh, role is. But so far, it hasn't come to that. Okay, thank you very much. chairs for the panel coming up, um, and uh, I wanted just to pass on to um, the Denali's Backcountry Management Plan can be found online if you go into Denali National Park's website, um, 
I can't tell you exactly how to find it uh, without a piece of paper in front of me. But uh, anyway, it is on the Valley National Park's website, and you can scroll around and eventually find that back of the management plan in its entirety there.